two lectures, we were looking uh, at the Bible, uh, both its uh, development, its reliability, and whether Muhammad is prophesied in the Bible. In this lecture and in the next one, I want to concentrate on the Quran. Uh, this lecture will be looking at the development of the Quran. Uh, now, the Quran means recitation or reading, and it is considered to be the very word of Allah eternally existing in a tablet in heaven. Now, according to Islamic belief, the Quran was recited piece by piece by the angel Gabriel to Muhammad, um, and Muslims believe that Muhammad made the arrangement of the chapters and the verses under the direction of Archangel uh, Gabriel. And furthermore, uh, they believe that it is all came directly from Allah to uh, Muhammad through Gabriel. Now, the fact of the matter is that uh, that is not true. And we know that, and what I'll be talking about primarily is found in Islamic sources themselves. We know, for example, that several passages uh, in the Quran uh, came from Muhammad's close friend Umar uh, bin al-Khattab, and at least one came from his friend Uthman. Uh, and so, for example, uh, Muslims used to pray uh, towards Jerusalem, but uh, the direction that they pray is now towards the Kaaba in Mecca, according to uh, Surah 2, verse 125. Uh, there are, I, I list six verses uh, in the Quran that came from, uh, were suggested by Umar or Uthman. And in fact, in the Hadith, uh, Uthman says that the Lord agreed with me in three things, and then he lists three of these different verses. And the, the odd thing is that Umar would make a suggestion to Muhammad, we should pray towards the uh, Kaaba, uh, and then Muhammad would get this revelation. Uh, and as John Gilchrist, who has written quite a lot on Islam and the Quran, says, the irony is found in the timing of each of these revelations. Not only did Allah give Muhammad exactly the same advice as Umar, but he did so almost immediately after Umar had spoken. Uh, so, some passages came from Umar or Uthman. Now, many passages in the Quran and in Islamic practice are rooted in paganism or in Judaism uh, or Christianity. Now, we know that Arab polytheism is the source of some of the most important things in Islam. The Kaaba in Mecca, the, the most holy place where all the Muslims uh, make a pilgrimage to, uh, that, now, the Quran contends that that was built by Abraham and Ishmael, uh, but the fact of the matter is, the Kaaba itself was in existence, of course, long before Muhammad, and it had been the site of pagan idol worship. In fact, the Kaaba had had 360 uh, idols. Uh, this is before Muhammad comes onto the scene. In fact, because of the idolatry associated with the Kaaba, Muhammad wanted to destroy the Kaaba, but he knew that uh, his tribe, the Qurayshis, who he was trying to win toward it, to Islam, uh, would object to that. So instead of destroying it, he made the Kaaba the very centerpiece of uh, Islam. Uh, furthermore, pagan pilgrimages to the Kaaba had been going on for hundreds of years before uh, Muhammad. Well, Muhammad just adopted the same practice and now says it's an Islamic practice. But other sources, for example, the Persian re religion of Zoroastrianism is the source of uh, the Surat. You may recall when we were discussing sin and salvation according to uh, Islam, that Muslims believe that everyone is going to have to pass over a razor-thin bridge between uh, hell and paradise. That bridge is called the Surat. That stems from uh, an ancient Zoroastrian book. Uh, now, the Old Testament and Jewish legends and Jewish commentaries are the source of a lot in the Quran. I mean, for example, uh, the uh, Quran refers repeatedly to Old Testament characters like Moses and Abraham uh, and uh, 
David and Solomon and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, the Quran draws on several accounts uh, from the Old Testament, including the uh, creation of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, Cain and Abel, and so on and so forth. All of these things had been written long before Muhammad came onto the scene uh, in the Old Testament. But also Jewish myths uh, play a part in the Quran. In Surah 27, it includes a lengthy account of Solomon and uh, uh, who, according to that account, had the ability to understand the speech of birds. Now, the visit by the Queen of Sheba to Solomon, uh, according to the Quran, had been arranged by a particular kind of bird. According to uh, Surah 27, Solomon wanted to convert uh, the Queen of Sheba to Islam, and he devised various tests for her. Um, and at one point, she tucked up her skirts, uncovering her legs, and it revealed uh, that, her, that she had hairy legs. And uh, according to Tafsir al-Jalalain, a famous uh, historic uh, commentary on the Quran, it talks about uh, Solomon wanted to marry her, but he disliked her hairy legs. Uh, and so he made something of lime mixture to remove the hair from her legs. This account... Uh, is based upon an old Jewish book called the Targum of Esther, which there are some differences, but it, it has the Targum of Esther regarding this account has talking animals uh, and a letter from the Queen of Sheba, who's a pagan, and it even has the hairy legs. So this did not come direct from Allah at all. Now, another source of the Quran, of course, is the New Testament and Christian Apocrypha. And when I say Christian Apocrypha, I mean accounts by Christians that are not canonical. There may, they may be errors uh, in them. For example, we know from that a lot uh, of uh, in, in, in the Quran is from the Bible, of course, the mention of Jesus and John the Baptist and so on and so forth. Uh, but in the Quran, uh, some of the uh, aspects of the Quran are based on these heretical Christian apocryphal texts. For example, um, in Surah 3, it talks about uh, Mary, and it suggests that Mary may have been from the tribe of Levi, uh, that Allah miraculously provided her with sustenance when she was giving birth, uh, and uh, that lots were cast to see who would be entrusted with her care, and, and she went under the care of Zebedee. Now, Gerald Dirks, a Western Muslim, acknowledges that all of these points, which are not in the Bible, they are all from apocryphal writings known as the Gospel of the Nativity of Mary and the Proto-Evangelium of James. Um, and also, uh, in the Quran, Surah 19, it talks about Mary giving birth under a palm tree and then was miraculously provided with uh, water from beneath the tree. Those stories are taken from chapter 20 of a book called The Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew. Um, and so, uh, again, there's multiple sources for these stories in the Quran that were existing before the time of Muhammad. Now, uh, this is important because Muslims contend that the Quran is the uh, eternal word of Allah and that he that Allah is the sole source. Therefore, any attempt to find a human source would be in vain. But if we can show that some of the teaching of the Quran comes from earthly sources, as I've just mentioned, then doesn't Islam collapse to the ground? Doesn't the Quran collapse to the ground as being a claim that it came directly from Allah? It seems to me that logically follows. Some passages in the Quran relate directly to Muhammad's life as well. Now, let's take a look at how the Quran was compiled, because it's very interesting. Muslims, of course, maintain that the Quran is exactly the same, word for word, as it was given to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel. And I've mentioned this Nigerian Muslim, uh, Ajijola. He says that the Quran 
has never been altered at the hands either of its friends or its enemies. Uh, the book is exactly the way Muhammad received it. Well, the fact of the matter is, and we know this from uh, primarily uh, the Hadith and other uh, Islamic sources, Muhammad did not, the, the Quran was not compiled in writing during Muhammad's life. Uh, and so no complete written copy of the Quran existed when Muhammad was alive. Uh, and furthermore, the Quran was not arranged chronologically. The, the, surahs, the surahs were not uh, given in the order that they appear in the Quran. Now, that's why I have Appendix A in your book that shows the order that the surahs were given to Muhammad, allegedly by Gabriel, uh, and they're considerably different from the order in which they are uh, now. This will be important when we talk about the doctrine of abrogation in the next lecture. Um, so anyhow, um, the uh, some portions, uh, fragments of the Quran had been written down on animal skins or rocks or things like that, but they were never collected into one place. More important, Muhammad himself admitted that the Quran was given in seven different ways. Muslims say the Quran is exactly the way it was uh, given to Muhammad. Well, the fact of the matter is, and we know this from the Hadith, that there was this uh, uh, Muslim uh, called uh, Hakim. He was reciting a particular surah, uh, and uh, he was reciting it in one way, and then Umar, Muhammad's close friend, uh, said, who taught you to recite it that way? And Hakim said, Muhammad did. And Umar says, you told a lie because uh, he, he taught me to recite it differently. So, in a matter of fact, Umar was so angry he wanted to strangle Hakim. So, they, they both went to uh, Muhammad and uh, Muhammad said, okay, Hakim, recite. Hakim recited the way he had learned it. Muhammad said, that's right. That's the way I, it was revealed to me. Then Umar, you recite. Umar recited it his way. And Umar, uh, and, and Muhammad said, you're right. That's also the way it was recited to me. And then Muhammad said, it was revealed, the Quran has been revealed in seven different ways. So recite it whichever way you want. Most Muslims don't know that, but that is from the Hadith itself. Um, and so, how can you trust this? Which version do you have? Well, um, and these different versions could not be simply dialects or different ways of pronunciation, but they had to be textual, substantive differences between them. Otherwise, Umar would not have wanted to strangle Hakim. Now, let's take a look at the how the Quran was actually compiled. Again, no complete written version existed uh, when Muhammad died. After Muhammad died, I mean, there were a number of people who had memorized the entire Quran. They were known as Qaris. There was a battle called the Battle of Al-Yamama, and many of these Qaris were killed. So um, Umar went to the first caliph, Abu Bakr, and said, we need to compile the Quran and have it written down. And Bakr said, how dare I do something that Muhammad never did? which again proves that the Quran had not been written down at that point. Well, Umar said, this will be helpful. So, uh, Bakir appointed a guy named Zaid to go and collect all the different, you know, portions of the Quran and talk to the Qaris that were still alive. And he did that and compiled the Quran into one volume. Now, uh, but his search obviously did not collect the whole thing. How do we know that? Well, there is a book, unfortunately it's only in Arabic, it has not been translated into English, by Ibn Abi Dawood, called Kitab al-Masahif, but John Gilchrist quotes from it, and Dawood says, many passages uh, of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama, but they were not known by those who survived nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakir, Umar, or Uthman collected the, the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. So what 
Dawood is saying is there were a lot of verses, maybe even whole surahs, in the Quran that were never written down, were not collected, and died with the Qaris on the Battle of Yamama. Now, the third caliph is Uthman. And so about 19 years after Muhammad died, there was a, a, a general led an expedition into Syria. Uh, and his troops partly came from Syria and partly from Iraq. But both sets of troops, they started reciting the Quran and they were reciting it differently. And they got so angry at each other, they started calling each other unbelievers. Well, there were a lot of complaints. They went to the caliph, uh, Uthman, and Uthman uh, said, send all your manuscripts of the Quran, because some of these people had written down uh, the Quran, you see. Uh, and so then he had Zaid and a committee of four uh, rewrite the Quran, and then Uthman said, all these ones that you've sent to me, burn them. Now this is amazing. The Quran was believed to be the very word of God, yet Uthman burned and destroyed complete manuscripts of the Quran that had been written down by Muhammad's immediate companions. The only thing that can account for this um, is that there were such substantive variations between this version of the Quran and that person's Quran that they had to be destroyed and, uh, and again, systematized into one new Quran. Um, and again, much of this is from the Hadith, but I also quote from other sources. But even Uthman's revision did not solve the problem, because a Muslim scholar named Cyril Glasse says, after uh, Uthman's revision of the Quran, uh, there were still various errors because at that point the Arabic language uh, at that point did not have little vowel markers uh, or, or other dots used to distinguish between certain letters. So ambiguities arose. Now in the year uh, between 1850, 859 and 936 there was a man named Abu Bakir ibn Mujahid and he decided to uh, say, we're going to try and cut down the number of these differences. So he selected seven readings. Again, these seven readings are different, but each reading was by two transmitters. So there are a total of 14, and they're all different. Uh, uh, and in addition to that, since that time, three additional readings uh, in addition to Ibn uh, Mujahid seven, have been generally accepted as canonical. The fact of the matter is, and I quote in your book from a Muslim, Dr. Muhammad Roy Perwanto, who says, actually there are several schools of Quranic recitation, all of which teach possible pronunciations, uh, and so uh, there are seven reliable, three permissible, uh, and uh, eight sub-traditions, making a total of 80 different variants allowed. Now, even two transmitters of a single reader result in hundreds of variations. Another Muslim writer says that he compared two, I mean, again, there's seven readers, seven canonical readers, each one had two transmitters. This one Muslim looked at the two transmitters of just one reader and found 520 differences between them. Now, Muslims may say, well, these are just simply differences of dialect or accent or something, but that's not true. Um, it, it affects the substance of the meaning. And this uh, Muslim guy, uh, Perwanto, in an article, which I quote, says that, he says, he gives example of 10 verses where different readings can make a different meaning of the verses. In other words, it makes substantive difference. And it says, it makes a different opinion in Islamic jurisprudence. In fact, uh, one source uh, looked at um, all the major versions 
uh, the different readings of the Quran, and the total number of variants listed for all the surahs came to over 10,000. So any Muslim who says that all the Qurans are exactly uh, alike and are exactly the way uh, Muhammad received it is wrong. And again, this is primarily from Islamic sources. There are multiple different authorized versions of the Quran. They are all different. Now, but the situation is even worse than that. We know of multiple verses in the Quran, and this again from the Hadith, that no longer exist. Yeah, I, I'll, let me give you just one example. Aisha, Muhammad's widow, uh, was having a slave write down the Quran, and uh, he says, Aisha ordered me to transcribe a copy for her, but she said, when you reach this verse, guard the prayers and the middle prayer, which is Surah 2, verse 238, inform me. So when I reached it, I informed her, and she told me this. It says, guard the prayers and the middle prayer and the afternoon prayer, and stand up and truly obey Allah. And Aisha said, that's the way I heard it from Muhammad. That's not the way it is in the Quran today. But even more than that, entire surahs appear to be missing from the Quran. Uh, one of the early authorities uh, of the Quran uh, said to uh, reciters, we used to recite a surah that resembled in length surah 9. However, I've forgotten it with the exception of two verses. And uh, Sam Shamoon, an, an author who has written extensively on these things, he quotes from multiple Muslim sources uh, and talks about the fact that Surah 33 has only one quarter of the number of verses that it originally contained. Now, there are also multiple textual variants in the uh, Quran, and we know this because before um, uh, Uthman standardized the Quran, uh, people such as a guy named uh, Abdullah bin Masood had written down the Quran, and it had been the accepted text of Muslims in Kufa. Now, Ibn Abi Dawood, the guy who wrote this book, Kitab al-Mashihif, he devotes 19 pages in his book showing variants and differences between Masood's text and the one that Zaid did for Uthman. And furthermore, there are 149 cases in Surah 2 alone where Masood's uh, text and Uthman's revision differ. Indeed, if you look at the extent of variant readings in the early Quranic manuscripts, in existence at the time of Uthman's revision, they fill 330 pages of uh, a book by a guy named Jeffrey called Materials for the History of the Text of the Quran. Now, these variants were known by early Islamic scholars. In fact, in the year 995, a guy uh, named uh, uh, Ishaq al-Nadim wrote a book called Al-Firist, uh, the Catalog, which was a compendium, con compendium of knowledge and books uh, in early Islam. In his book, uh, he has seven different, he describes seven, di seven different books that describe discrepancies between the manuscripts of different existing uh, texts of the Quran. So these things have been known to Muslim scholars for over a thousand years and, and more, actually going back to the very beginning. So any Muslim who says that the Quran, and they may attack the Bible, oh, the Bible has been changed. No, not as we saw in an earlier lecture. lecture, the Bible has not been changed. The Quran has been changed and it has you know, there are multiple different authorized versions that are different in substance today. Now, so you need to know these things uh, to be able to counter Muslim claims. Let me conclude this lecture by saying this. Although Uthman tried to standardize the Quran, remember that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And the weak link for the Quran stems from 
Uthman, uh, because we know that multiple different texts existed, that Uthman burned them, but he didn't destroy because we know that they had been written down and we know from history that there are these multiple different uh, readings. Finally, uh, as we pointed out, uh, Mujahid standardized, and there are now ten recognized readings. Each one has multiple transmitters, uh, and therefore the Qurans that exist in the world today are not the same. Rather, they contain thousands of variants, many of which affect the substance and the meaning of the Quran itself. In other words, it's not just minor wording differences, it is substantive differences. So, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about contradictions and errors in the Quran and the doctrine of abrogation.